Hello, my name is Brian Lockmiller. I will be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it a slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brian, thank you for reading the scripture today. We appreciate you doing that. So, we love sports, don't we? We love sports. We love it. We love watching sports. We love talking about sports. We love spending money on sports. We love forcing our ki children into sports. A little bit of a joke there. We love, uh, right? We, I mean, we love reminiscing about sports. We love sports in this culture. But it's, it's, it's more than just something we do. I mean, it's, it's almost an identity, of course. You know, you're known as, well, you're a Cowboys fan. You're a Mavericks fan, you're a Stars fan, you're whatever. You, we're, we're identified that way. We wear the team jerseys, we put the bumper stickers on our car, we put those things in our front yard sometimes that says, you know, something vile like a Patriots fan lives here, something like that. We're identified by our sports, the teams that we love and what we love to do. And so finally, we have the Olympics. Delay the year, of course, by the pandemic. Uh, the Olympics just just tons of fun. I mean, you got all these competitors from around the world coming together, and so much is riding on everything, right? Every movement, every action, every infraction, everything. There's so much riding on it because of all the years of preparation it took to get to that point. And they all want to get on the medal stand. They want the prize. They want to be on the medal stand. Now, obviously, you you prefer the gold medal, you, that means you're first. You want the gold medal. But even if you're the bronze medalist, the rest of your life, you're known as an Olympic medalist. You want to get to the medal stand. So, this is, of course, uh, the modern Olympics that we uh, have now. Modern Olympics were born uh, in a meeting in 1894. Uh, Baron Pierre de uh, Coubertin, uh, from France, met with a delegation of, I think it was 34 different people from different countries, with the idea of, of having the Olympic Games again, and having it internationally, having it in different places. His recommendation was, let's do it in 1900, the turn of the, of the century, 1900 in Paris. Well, they were so enthusiastic of his idea, they said, no, why wait? Let's do it two years from now, in 1896, and let's do it in Athens. And so that's what they did. They started in 1896 in Athens, and the Olympic International Olympic Committee was born, and uh, Pierre de Coubertin was the first president, the first chair of uh, the IOC. So it was fitting that it was in Greece, of course. That's where the Olympics started. In Olympia, Greece is where they were held. Starting in the year 776, they know that historically for sure. There's suspicion that happened even started even before that. But they know 776, before the Common Era. So in other words, when Jesus was born, the Olympics had already been going for about 800 years. That's a long time before, in terms of our time frame as we think about that. It ended in uh, 393, after Christ. So to put that in some kind of framework, when you, when you think about events in the Bible, you always like to think of timelines. What else is happening in the world at that time? And so uh, when we went through the story, we talked all the way through the Old Testament and the New Testament, we talked about how long ago um, the northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians. That's about the time the Olympics were starting. And then when you think in Christian history, think of some of the early great uh, leaders in the early, early church, great theologians, one of the ones, one of those names that pops up very quickly is Augustine, St. Augustine. Well, he was active in the 4th century, so 393, that's about the time of St. Augustine's life and work. So that's a long time, over a millennia, once every four years, having the Olympics going. 
Events were added over time. Of course, it didn't start off with all these different events. It was one event to start with. And over time, they added events and events. And then when the winner of the, of the events would have, be given a wreath made out of olive branches. The, that was the job of the judges. The official judges of the Olympics, uh, their job was they would receive branches that had been cut from wild olive trees that grew in that area, and they themselves would make the wreaths that they would place on the head of the ones who won their event. That was the crown. That was, the, that was their form, version of a medal back in that day. So when we read in the New Testament, when you read Paul's letters, he frequently used sports images and sports metaphors, analogies. That, that, I mean, so the, he would have known about the Olympic Games in that day and time. So he uses these sports images. I, just some quick examples. So when you're looking at his letters to, to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4.8, while physical training is of some value, godliness is valuable in every way. 2 Timothy 2.5, in the case of an athlete, no one is crowned without competing according to the rules. 2 Timothy 4.7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Fought the good fight, finished the race. So we take these sports metaphors to try to speak to a deeper truth, right? We do that. We do that. You'll see uh, sometimes people's T-shirts that'll have uh, some, uh, a, a depiction of the sport or fitness activity that they do along with some scripture passage or an image from the Bible. I mean, Brian Lockmiller was doing it <laughs> and when you saw him read the scripture. You know, if we were sitting here, he had on the, the fit T-shirt with the cross on it. We do, we do these things as well to help us have an understanding, a glimpse of an insight. Now, one of the difficulties, of course, anytime someone's using a metaphor or analogy, if you push any analogy too far, it, it breaks down, it falls apart. And it can lead you to misunderstanding what it's trying to point to. I mean, the point of a metaphor or analogy is to give you a glimpse of new insight and understanding, not to carry the whole weight of the meaning. So, so let's... Read this, let me reread a couple of those uh, verses uh, that he read. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. We have to be real careful in understanding what is the prize. What is that crown that we're striving toward? I mean, it's, it's, we have an analogy, we have a metaphor. What, what is the prize? Well, we, we have to remember the context of the letter. Remember, when we read, uh, we're reading somebody else's mail when we read Paul's letters. And so there's this long, long letter. And we just read a few sentences. The context of the whole letter begins in chapter 1 when he says to them, I hear there are quarrels and divisions among you. And his whole letter is saying, this is not what God intends. I mean, in a sense, he's saying, I hear that you, there are competitions going on among each other in the church. Thinking some people are more important than other people, some activities more important than other activities, and so you're having this kind of hierarchy you're trying to establish in the church and you're doing this infighting and, and no that's not what god intends so so if, if he, he's saying no this internal competition is not right then what's the prize well we get a little more glimpse when you look into the chap, chapter nine the whole of the chapter this is that chapter where uh paul says you know when when i am uh, with a greek i speak as a greek when i'm with a jew i speak as a jew when i'm with you know it, and what he's saying is, and, and then he says, I, I've become all things to all people. He's not saying that he's wishy-washy, that he has no convictions. He's saying, I'll connect with anybody where they are. I'll connect with anybody where they are so that he would have the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ in such a way that they would hear, see, and receive that good news of Jesus Christ, and believe themselves. That is the prize. The witness of your life having an impact on another person. That's the prize that will not go away. 
Anything else we do for ourselves is temporary. I mean, so often you hear that the depictions, uh, popular depictions you might see of people on social media and other places of what they think living the Christian faith is uh, these days is basically to make my life easy and comfortable. It's that it's about me. But in fact, as we've studied before, we've talked about before that, that God calls the people, us, to be a blessing to all the families of the earth and to be a witness of faith of God's love that we know in Jesus Christ. And when we do that in a way that somebody else sees, hears, receives, believes, that's the prize. That's the prize Paul is talking about. I heard, uh, or I think I read a sentence recently, and I, and I, I can't find, I, should, I know when I quote somebody, I've got to cite them, right? I'm supposed to say, oh, this is in such and such, and I can't find it, I'm sorry. So if you know where it is, please let me know, let me know. But the sentence was this. If you think your life's work can be accomplished in your lifetime, you're not dreaming big enough. If you think your life's work can be accomplished in your lifetime, you're not dreaming big enough. Now, that's not a specifically Christian thing, right? But it it really helps us to think about our life and, and, and the impact our life has that's beyond what we do while we're on this earth. It's those lives we influence. It's those situations we've impacted, that we've, we've made the community around us a better place. We've, we've helped someone else to find hope when they had no hope. We've had somebody else find uh, compassion when they desperately needed compassion. The impact and influence of our lives goes beyond our life on earth. That's the prize that will not go away. In the 2016 Olympics, uh, the event was a a qualifying heat for the women's 5,000 meter, 5K. A lot lot of us on, you know, it's a weekend run, right? That's, you do a 5K event. Uh, It's a women's 5,000 meter at the Olympics, qualifying event. About two-thirds of the way into the race, Nikki Hamlin of uh, New Zealand finds herself boxed in by other runners. Now, if you know anything about distance running, you don't want to be there. You don't want to be boxed in. It's, you can't get out, and it's way too easy for her feet and legs to get tangled up. And that's what happened. She's running along, and she said all she knew was she was running, and the next minute, she's on the ground. Just, bam, hit the ground, is just stunned, trying, thinking, what happened? Why am I here? Where, where am I? And the next thing she knows is someone is grabbing her shoulder, saying, come on, get up. We have to finish this. Now, that was Abby D'Angostino, an American. She had been right behind Nikki Hamlin. When Nikki Hamlin went down, she then fell right over her, and she hurt her knee. She said, come on, we got to do this. Nikki Hamlin, Nikki Hamlin said, yeah, in that moment, I thought, that's right. This is the Olympics. i got to finish and at that point, but, but by that point, there's no way they're going to place, right? They're not going to qualify. The runners are long gone. But they get up, and they finish the race. Nikki Hamlin finished about a minute after the one who finished first, uh, and um, uh, Abby D'Angostino finished about two minutes behind that. After D'Angostino finished and got to the finish line, she fell down to the track, and they came out, and they actually ended up wheeling her off in a wheelchair. She had torn her ACL. But that action had an impact on Nikki Hamlin. She said, when someone asks me 20 years from now what happened in Rio, Rio de Janeiro, this is my story. Regardless of the race and the result on the board, it's a moment that you'll never, ever forget for the rest of your life. There's going to be that girl shaking my shoulder saying, come on, get up. D'Angostino and Hamlin knew that this was more than just a race to get to the medal stand. There's more at stake. I don't, I, I don't think it's insignificant to mention that Abby D'Angostino is a Christian. You can go to her website where she writes about fitness and running and faith. 
that to her this moment is more. And that shaking the shoulder of Nikki Hamlin, saying, come on, get up, made an impact on her. That's the prize we're looking for. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for, uh, we're grateful for Paul, who did share this good news with so many people in such a way that it, it impacted people's lives. And they came to believe in the good news of Jesus Christ, and they experienced joy, and they experienced compassion and hope. And then they had an impact on the lives of other people, offering compassion and hope and direction and love so that they could reach out to other people. And so, God, we hear your word today in that same way. The call to understand that the prize of living the Christian faith is not just, not just about me. It's about helping someone else have a better life, have a better situation, helping the community around me. And we know, God, that is the prize that will not perish, that will not go away. That prize is eternal. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.